Bags down, spikes on, welcome to the track. Hi, my name is Colin Waitsman, and I'm going to be your host for this episode of Track World News presented by the Harrier. And today we have a very special guest joining us, probably has the biggest following within track and field. It's been on my, on this show. He has over 115,000 followers on Instagram, 2.3 million likes on TikTok. You've seen him across social media, uh, head coach and founder of Fast You, Will Collins. Coach Will, thanks for, for joining us today. Really appreciate uh, it. Th thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. For sure. For sure. Definitely excited to, to get into this stuff for sure. And um, mm -hmm. before we get into any track and field stuff, because I know we're going to talk about that for a while. Um, you mentioned something that you're interested in off the track are, is karaoke. Uh, you like singing. Yeah, yeah. You see it on a, on your YouTube channel a little bit. Can you see what mm -hmm. are what are the top three go to songs that, that you have to pick whenever you're you're doing some karaoke there? I'm gonna say Usher, Nice and Slow, and then um, uh, Before Your Time probably. But uh, if if I ever fall in love by Shy, and uh, Boys to Men, uh, End of the Road. Ooh, that's not bad. <laughs> that's oh yeah, <laughs> got to be able to have a few of those go tos for whenever you're, you know, going out for sure, man. You, you never know, never know when they might call you up on stage. You never know, man. Exactly. Got to be ready. That peer mm -hmm. pressure goes crazy when you're 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 sitting there. It's like, ah, oh, go ahead, he can sing. Yeah, then. Yeah, yeah, we love it. We actually have fun. That's actually one of the things that we do. All of the coaches, we actually go out like uh, every once in a while. We'll do karaoke just to kind of, you know, get away from the track. Yeah, loosen it up a little bit for sure. Mm -hmm. And yep. you also mentioned you're you're a big documentaries fan. Any any ones mm -hmm. in particular that you're that you really like or, or one that you maybe watched recently that, that really caught your eye? Oh well, really, we create our own documentaries. Oh, so and create yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. So that's really what we're into. We actually have our we have our own media company. So uh, me and Baller Tribe, we actually create our own documentaries. We're doing some for some for some elite sprinters here soon as well. So be on the lookout for that. No, oh, awesome. Well, that's that's even better. Yeah. Going from watching to to making. Are are there any absolutely? Are there any ones that you kind of took, I guess, st stylistic reference from, like any particular, whether it be thirty for thirties or anything like that, where you're like, okay, that's that's inspiration, I guess you could say, in in the style that you're making a, a documentary on. Yeah, definitely. We took a lot of different styles. I think a lot of, a lot of things nowadays is based off of premium content. So premium content is considered content that's within a week. It's very relative to now. It's within a week or two weeks of whatever the event is, you know, it is. Um, and that documentary style allows it to be a little bit more like real and raw. I mean, similar to Tiger King, uh, similar to uh, Hard Knocks. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's right there. It's happening. Some of the stuff is like an outtake. Yeah, and it's, I mean, the whole world's moving towards YouTube. YouTube is just dudes vlogging, man, with real life. So I think that's more of the style that we're on, keeping it more uh, real life, but showing like an intimate look. So more similar to like, um, I guess you could say a 30 for 30 or, you know, similar to that. Yeah. Yeah. It's always, I've always loved that, uh, like the the hard knock stuff. And I know we had the, there was a documentary that Flow Track did on uh, Houston track uh, a, mm -hmm. a couple of years back. Like, it's cool to get the inside scoop of you know, what's going on behind the scenes. Cause you don't, you don't see that. You just see the athletes, they show up to the track, they run and they go. So it's always cool to be yeah. able to see, you know, what's going on at practice. Like how, what's, what's all that build up. Yeah. And you get to get to know the characters. I think track and field lacks a lot because of the perception of knowing the people behind track and field. There's so many beautiful people physically and, you know, just inside, you know, character wise that, you know, that need to be highlighted more. I think, once people meet the characters of track and field, they'll be in love with the sport. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. Some great personalities. Mm -hmm. And once we can start show, showcasing those stories, uh, it's only going to grow, uh, grow from there. So there's a bunch of characters in track for sure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so wanted to start with, you know, where did fast you come from? I mean, it's, you're really the, the premier, one of the premier spaces, especially within sprinting. You're, you're, if there's any, athlete or video on the internet that is is sprinting you can almost guarantee we're going to see a comment from you or or a reply from you guys um wh where did this you know brand and, and company really come from uh originally yeah i mean for me i started off as a, as a track coach um in 2002 a long time ago um i was still a high school kid understood that i wanted to be a coach i studied a lot of information about um 
you know, track and field and science and sprinting, that information wasn't out for everybody. So I had to really look, dig deep. I looked into John Smith. Um, I mean, a lot of the top folks, uh, John Smith, Dan Path, um, Charlie, uh, I'm sorry, Charlie Francis, uh, Ben Johnson's coach. Uh, I mean, I studied the Russians' plyometrics and the Germans' plyometrics in the 70s, you know, stuff that we're still doing now. I was just a studying kid. I'm Korean, so my mom just kind of built me that way. I was born in Korea. So we were literally like taught to like, you need to study stuff and figure things out, right? So um, with that being said, um, I figured out sprinting and biomechanics a little bit. And I started coaching. Uh, I started coaching at a young age. I was like probably 19, you know? Um, I developed the fastest girl in the world in 2007, uh, NCAA champion in the 60 and 07 at the same year. Um, and the next year, the next fastest girl in the world the next year. And every year after that, we developed some of the fastest athletes in the world ever since then. It was, it was between me and my father as well. My dad was, my dad ended up learning the uh, workout side of it, the energy systems and the strength training a bit. And then I got to learn the mechanics and the technique. So we came together and collaborated those two things together. Um, we developed a lot of great athletes. I ended up moving to Houston um, eventually. Um, started off with a little track team here called Prototype. We obviously did well. Um, and that kind of led off into Fast University. I didn't understand posting online, so I studied marketing for about six years and um, just trying to figure things out. And then eventually just kind of clicked that people needed help around the world to learn, you know, sprinting, you know, and I was, I didn't even know what I was doing, but I made a post and it was one post. And I was like, I put one, two, and three. Like, I want to see, you know, projection out, I'm looking to see, you know, their arm stroke back correlating with their knee drive, something like that. It's like bing, 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 bullet list. Yeah. I'm gonna be honest with you. All my posts is doing like 500 average, you know, of views. <laughs> yeah. That one view did like, that one post went 40,000 views in, in an instant. But that was my first time ever putting what I'm trying to look for in the post. I usually just, this is this kid, he runs fast, this is yeah. his name, whatever. I don't know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, <laughs> so, it, you know, I re from that moment, I recognize there's a need here. And, you know, I said, man, I need to supply the need because people need this. And plus, I, I live where I'm at in Houston. And there was a lot of, uh, not say poor coaching, but a lot of old school ways of doing things. And there was no congruent scientific understanding. I don't want everybody to do it my way, but I'd like you to at least have a scientific understanding of what's going on. You know what I mean? And you can choose your way. So we did that in the last few years. And it's been such a great impact to see what we've done locally, globally. And it really just started from me wanting to see more people do it. And most people don't have access. Not everybody can come see me. Not everybody can train with me and not maybe not came before me, maybe, you know, but what we're giving out for free. If you're really hungry, like I was, you can make it work, dude, because I made it work. You know what I mean? So that's kind of the concept of what we have for Fast University is to help others. Yeah, and, and you've definitely done that. Like we mentioned, over 2.3 million likes on TikTok. Like just, just those short minute long clips can, you know, help people go a long way. I mean, it doesn't take a whole lot of stuff to, to you know, be able to fuel those next great sprinters. And with sprinting, it's, it's one of those things that on the outside, like if you just ask someone that isn't in the track world, there's no, they're like, no, there's no technique to sprint. You just run fast. You just, you, the, the gun goes off and you just run. And once you, you get to the end, you're done. There, there's no technique <laughs> in it. Like, and so, yeah, yeah as a, a coach, I'm sure you're like, no, and just shaking your head. Like, that's not it at all. There's so much mm -hmm. that goes into the running and that can help you drop your time significantly if you're just doing it the right way. Exactly. Yeah. And so now that it's been your, your brand has been growing and you've seen that you've been able to help people, not just locally, but globally, I mean, what's that feeling like for you going from, hey, you started off just a kid, 19 years old coaching to now you're helping, you know, the top athletes, not only in the country, but, you know, in the in the world to be able to reach some of their fullest potential. I mean, it's an amazing feeling. I think God has really blessed me. I remember I wanted to do this. This is what I foresaw for me to do as a young man. And I'm doing it. And it's it's awesome, man. You know, when you actually accomplish what you set out to do, it's, it's awesome. And then I, I've never calculated how much of an impact we could have made. This is far beyond what I expected. And that's how great God is. You know, that's, that's how I look at it. You know, and it's just amazing, amazing thing to happen. And for me, the excitement for me is that I got to see a lot of kids and a lot of coaches become better. 
I've had parents, I mean, this is real. Like I've had a parent come up to me in Alabama and started crying and said, you don't understand, we don't have money. And you, you gave us an opportunity to go to college. You know what I mean? Like my kids have gotten better and she's going to school because of the stuff that you was putting out there. And I was able to use it in the last three years. I was like, man, you know, and I, I want to thank you, take a picture with you and I'm supporting you, you know, and that, that's positive, man. That's, that's definitely a really positive and a humbling experience because, uh, you know, we grew up kind of poor too. So it's like, you know, it's like you, you get, you're giving back to the same situation. You're fixing things. You know what I mean? Yeah. To, to hear that you helped some kid that you've never, you never heard of, didn't know their name. Never met. Yeah. Never, yeah. You know, wouldn't know them from anything, but Hey, you, mm-hmm. you assisted them in getting a scholarship and, and bettering their life. It's like, Oh, wow. Like this is, yeah, this is, this is greater than me. And to take those opportunities yeah. that, that are, that you're gifted to yourself is like, yeah, you don't want to let any of those go to waste because you don't know how it's going to affect not only yourself, but you know, the, the greater, you know, good as a whole. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. For sure. We're definitely blessed, man. We're blessed. For sure. And so now I want to get into a little bit of the technical aspects of, of sprinting. Like I mentioned, a lot of my, a lot of the listener base here is uh, our sprinters are just getting started with, with sprinting. And so I know you probably hate this question, but it's, I'm sure you probably get it a lot. Like what, when somebody, if you get a kid for, it's probably, let's say high school kid, maybe just, just getting started in their sprinting career. And they're like, I want to run faster. How can I just run faster? And if you didn't know, you know, it's like, hey, they don't have videos, it's just some guy walking up to you at the mall. What would be your first, I guess, few tips on, hey, you want to make sure you're doing this, that, and the third uh, to just improve your overall speed there? I mean, if you're just asking a general question of how do I get faster? Yeah. And if somebody asks me that, I'd be like, why do you want to get faster? That'd be the <laughs> next question, right? Why do you want to get faster? But I think why I ask why is because that kind of determines what's next, right? So I want to get faster because I want to play football. I want to get faster because I want to be on varsity. Then it kind of explains to me what you're expecting to see. So if you just want to get regular, I just want to get a little bit faster and just in general, then get fit. Just get fit. Do some core, you know, stretch. I actually would say stretch first. That, that's the least, that is the least paid attention to thing. And that's probably one of the most impactful things. Like if you can gain range of motion, motion, as well as gain uh, a certain style of flexibility to your, to your muscles, you'll be able to train faster, longer, and you'll be able to be able to move better easily, a lot easier. So it makes everything a lot easier. So I would say getting your flexibility increased would be the number one thing in stretch. Obviously. Yeah, that's uh, I, I think I heard in one of your videos that you have either it's yourself or your athletes have a combined hour of stretching a, a day it's like hey you because if, if you don't if you don't have that flexibility you can't you can't get your knees in the right position you're not your arms aren't going to be in the right way and you're never going to be able to increase that speed so yeah i know and a it lot has of to do with recovery and it has a lot to do with recovery you know you know a lot of kids tighten up and get tight so the recovery process has a lot to do with stretching and mobility and active stretching so yeah it's, it's yeah. a lot to do with recovery you train a lot but the secret to getting fast is training effectively as much as possible. Does that make sense? So like if you can train and recover, then you're going to get faster automatically. The problem is if you're doing too much training, not enough recovering, that's burning you out. You see what I'm saying? So the key is finding a balance of cut recovery. And I think stretching is one of the biggest things, you know, for sure. Yeah. Cause burnout can be, can really set you back a little bit physically as well as, as mentally. I mean, do you guys do much work as well or, or focus on the, the mental aspect of, of sprinting? Cause it's such a short race. And you have so you're probably these athletes, you're you're in the, the warm up zone longer than you're actually competing. Like, so mm-hmm. you got a lot of time to, to think about your race. Like, how are how have you guys been you know, working with a lot of these young athletes on how to be mentally zoned in? So when it's time to go, you know, they're they're ready to fire at all cylinders. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean the mental aspect is one of the most uh, pr- prominent aspects that we focus on nowadays, because this year is we call it the year of champions. We have a lot of elite athletes from a lot of different ages. And the thing for us is that we took a smaller group this year to train them more uh, qualitatively, add more quality to their training, meaning knowing their mindset, knowing where their head is at. And then we're also coaching in a way to where the kids are executing a race plan or a strategy. So having that strategy and implemented in your training constantly allows you to do less thinking when it's time to actually run. You're just kind of doing what you've rehearsed. Does that make sense? So it's like choreography in a way. Um, we're very, very strict upon that. We stay upon it very quickly. I mean, very uh, quickly, but we stay on that very uh, intently. 
we, we make sure that we're holding our athletes accountable to that, especially as we get closer to the races. Um, I'm not a hard coach as far as like, I'm not a yelling type of dude. I'm not a get in your butt type of dude. We're more like just, this is not it. You know what I mean? And if you want it to be it, you need to do this. And if this doesn't happen, then I don't run track. That's always my number one comment. Yeah, I'm going to make a shirt that says, I don't run track. I coach. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah so like at the end of the day like if you don't do this you're gonna it's gonna affect your performance not mine you know they know me i coach you know what i mean like you got to do you you know what i mean so yeah. uh, i think the biggest thing is taking the stress out of training we don't we don't train to stress the kids out um a lot of our kids will come to practice maybe mentally burned by the day or by stuff at home we might just take a day off that day because we get enough training in and they go to school and train over there as well so it's like it's not like you're under trained you know what i mean we just need to do the right training at the right time. And we need to have you feeling good and vibing. I call it vibing, vibing right. You know, if the vibes are right, it'll, you'll get more out of your athlete. They want to do more in the reps. They'll put more out there and they'll run faster than me because they're feeling good, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're you, feeling confident. Yeah. Yeah. The, the confidence going into a race or a practice can, can be everything of when you're, because every, everyone knows, I'm sure you've been there when you line up on the practice line, it's like, man, I got these two hundreds today and mm. yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just go through it. You just get through the workout and it's like, mm. you don't, you're, you're mentally checked out. And then there's a big difference of when you're, you're locked in, you're like, okay, no, I got two hundreds today. I got one fifty. Mm. Like I need to, I need to make sure each rep is they have, and they have a race plan. So like, I'll give you an example. We have a 45 meter cone in, in some of our runs and you have to hit a certain number there. You can't BS me. You know what I mean? These numbers, you know what I mean? So like our kids run off of a strategy. So it's kind of like, if you're not doing it, it is what it is. Does that make sense? This is concrete. This is not great. It's not, you didn't seem like you was putting in effort there. Like, no, the number says you're not putting effort there. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you don't put the effort there, you don't get better. It is what it is. You know what I mean? And yeah. we, that's, how, that's how we go about it. And it puts the accountability back to them. And it takes the stress away from the relationship between the coach and the athlete. Because the coach knows that, that, you know, the athlete knows that the coach is extremely right. Because they're like, well, that makes sense. You know what I mean? I need to check myself. Does that make yeah. sense? Instead of you getting mad with the they always on my ass, you know what I mean? Like, no, it's actually logical what he's saying. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, no, it's I'm not I'm not just getting on you to get on you. It's like, no, I know you run these times. And when you're yeah. at this cone, you're at this number, you're not at it today. So what's going on? That's what yeah, that's and that's the that's a deeper question. You ask the kid that and it's like, I'm having a, you know, a girl might say I'm on my period, a guy might say, man, I was in football, this happened, I kind of tweaked my ankle. So you start to get more information here, you know what I mean? And that's really the big thing, like you said, about knowing your athlete, getting more out of them and being um, being more in tune with them so you can get the most out of them. That's the key. Just knowing what's going on with your athlete and then having measures that are very, very black and white that keeps you guys together on the same logic. It's like knowing the vision. People say trust the process. The kid has to know the process to trust it. You know what I mean? Nowadays, these kids don't trust nobody. Yeah. <laughs> which they shouldn't you know what i mean yeah if, if you don't you can't just blindly go into something being like yeah like i'm i'm, I'm believing in this i know what's going on like, if no, you're like yeah he's trained a lot of top guys don't believe the guy that trains a lot of top guys that's not the case L look at what's happening and understand it for yourself like i always tell my uh tell coaches my kids can come to your clinic and coach the clinic literally if you go to my practice i don't do as much coaching as people think my athletes actually coach the other athletes because they know the information or they can see it right. It's happening. Like you didn't sweep your hands. Like a kid will come ask another kid, an older one and be like, yo, what happened? And like, I didn't do this and that. You need to do this. That's what happened. You're, you're not in the right setting. Your knees are not lining up. You know what I mean? And, uh, they'll say all of that specific stuff and I don't have to because they know it. Mm -hmm. Which, which shows that's, it's the, like, that's the difference. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's those aspects of learning. I remember when I, my coach was saying, it's like, so there's times where you have to think about a process and, and you do it. And then there's the mm -hmm. unconsciousness where it's like, you just mm -hmm. like, I don't have to think about how to drink a glass of water. I just know how to mm -hmm. do it. You want to be to get mm -hmm. that same thing for your knee drive, where it's just as yep. simple as you unlocking your phone. You don't have to think about it. You just do mm -hmm. it. And so that's where you want to get to. And you know, when those athletes, when your athletes can start noticing that in other athletes, that's when it's like, okay, you've reached that up, that next level of learning where you can start yep. helping your peers as well. Yep. Being able to teach allows you to be able to retain more. You can teach the subject. You can, you'd really know the subject. Yeah. I know. Uh, I've heard a lot of people um, coaching. It's like, if you can't, if you can't teach it, if you can't say it in simple, simple terms and 
Yeah. You don't know it well you're enough. Not, you're, you don't, yeah, you're not that good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so you're, you're, you just, you gotta, you gotta learn a little bit more about it for sure. But um, yeah. So now wanted to flash back a little bit. Got a question from uh, so Coach Matthew uh, Matthew Parker, one of, friend of mine. He's uh, do, does a lot of content as well as helps coaching with with you. He, he gave me a few questions, and so I have uh-huh. I have one that I wanted to start off with. That I guess it's from when you were first starting off coaching. He said, "Could you mm-hmm. talk about when you were first starting out and you had to Uber to to practice and you weren't really getting paid when you were getting start, started out?" What was that like yeah. when you were in the grind originally of, of just getting started out coaching there? Man, man, that boy brought it out to the real stuff. <laughs> so, you know, I, I started off coaching and I did this for a while. And I'm not going to lie. We wasn't really getting paid well. I, and I didn't have a structure, I think, well enough. And I wasn't a responsible individual. I was a young man at the time. So a lot of little things added up. And I think that's what life is about, you know, understanding how life works, how business works how responsibilities are and how qualities of leadership you need to have to become a leader in anything. May it be industry, may it be a sport. So um, I used to Uber to every practice. Um, I literally Ubered to like a Tassa City, which is an hour away. I would Uber to Paraland. I would just go everywhere and train these athletes everywhere. And then to be real honest with you, you know how expensive Uber is. I was literally training to train. Like I was training to pay for Ubers basically, you know what I mean? So this is basically a community service, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I, that made me who I am today because I'm willing to do a lot of things for free. I'm willing to clean the toilets. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to uh, get it done. I like to win. I like to win for real. So I remember when I didn't have much and now that I have more, I still act like I don't have much because it don't, it don't take much now. You know what I mean? When you've done it with a little, it don't take a lot, you know? And that's kind of where we're at. When you give me a lot now, I'm like, wow. And we got, you know, and we got this too. You know what I mean? So I'm living in a very good time because of that. I think the low times get me, allows me to appreciate these times. It allows me to stay humble during these times. Yeah, it's something, there's something about starting from, yeah, nothing and, or, or very little and then growing up mm-hmm. to having something you know, that's so much greater because it's like, I'm sure you coaching yourself, you coaching, if, if you were to flash back to then say, hey, by the way, you're going to have one of the premier coaching brands in all of sprinting track and field, and you're going to be making X, Y, Z, doing ABC, you'd be like, get out of here. No, nah, no, nah, there's no way. Yeah. And so you, yeah. you, you, you know what you went through. Coming. Yeah. 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 I think what we went through definitely helped me uh, become the man that I am and the leader that I am now. And it's like I said, for everybody else that's become an entrepreneur or anything. You know, just trust the process, uh, have faith in your purpose. Don't ever quit on what you dream about. If you dream about this and you're willing to work for it, you're going to have it. Yeah. And um, so you mentioned that you're, you're Korean, you're, you're originally born in Korea. So I was yeah. wondering, was there ever a thought of you con- considering coaching the Korean national team at one of the yeah. beach? that have been a consideration for you? Yeah, I, I'm actually thinking about it myself. Um, uh, Karan Conright, which is a former HSI sprinter, used to coach for Korea. It was a while back. And that's when my mind was like, what? And I'm not hating on the guy, but I'm just like, what? You know, he's like a newer coach, younger coach. And I was like, he's already coaching at, at, my, at my country? You know what I mean? So, you know, I was like, well, it gave me the opportunity to think that I can do it myself, too. So I would love to do so. I've been in touch with, uh, with the Federation a few times. Uh, I've talked with some of the top performance fellows out in Seoul, Korea. So I will be making a trip out there. We will be shaking hands and talking and getting to know each other more. Um, At the moment, I don't think I have the ability to do so because of uh, my partner, Hurdle Science. He's the German national hurdle coach. So he's here now. So we're bringing in German national sprinters and a couple of different sprinters. I mean, not sprinters, but hurdlers from all around the world. So I can't be the national coach at this moment because of time restriction and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Well, that's got to be still a cool – predicament to still be in where it's like yeah you got you know being able to have an even have an opportunity and and going out to be able to represent you know your nation is not that's a very short list of people that that get to compete or coach at a a national level to be able to you know rep your your country's flags and colors and be able to say yeah i'm i'm part of this thing you know representing millions of people across the country there i look forward to it like i said i'm very proud of you know who i am as an individual you know on both sides um I love where, I, where my home, where I came from. I was born there originally, and uh, I think it represents something that's needed in in Korea because there's not many sprinters there, you know, that are elite at all. So I know I can make a big impact. So whenever that time comes, it will happen. You know, what I mean, it's going to be a very, very uh, rewarding moment for me for sure. Definitely, definitely. And uh, 
So right now, like we mentioned, FastU has, has grown. It's a, it's a large thing. It's a large brand right now. Where do you see FastU being within the next you know, two, three, five years from now, you know, what, what would you like for, what would you consider? Okay. We we're successful. This is what we want to do. You know, goals for yourself within the next five years. Uh, our next goal within the next few years and that this year and the last year has been to empower more coaches. So, you know, our initiative is to empower more coaches. We've seen that um, we've done really well with the athletes and everybody likes what we're doing and the coaches as well. But we've realized there was a very strong disparity in coaches education and then um, coaches getting access to things that are applicable. A lot of things online are very, um, how do I, I'm not even going to say it in a, in a professional way. It's very old school, man. It's throwback, it's clinical, it's dry, you know. And I think what we're doing is very now, very easily to easily consumable, very relatable. You know, you can understand it. You can see the videos. It doesn't, I know people who don't, who barbecue for a living, who understand my videos, you know what I mean? So like they never ran track ever. And like, I never knew, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm more into that at the moment. Um, as far as a brand, um, we have our own clothing line. Obviously we're making premium goods coming up here soon for uh, sprinters and track runners and just everybody, just anybody who needs faster clothing, you know what I mean? And who likes to be faster. So, you know, you could be the fastest chess player. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, so that's that's where we're going with the clothes. I mean, it's all about culture. So we actually doing documentaries. We got one with Justin Gatlin and a couple other top athletes. Um, the big thing for us is just to provide more for the sport, man. I think the sport is underserved. Um, I don't think the athletes are being highlighted in the way that they should all the way yet. I think there's a lot more to track than running fast and winning medals and being the Olympic champion or the world champion or the first or the second or the third place person. I think the process and the journey is more exciting. Whenever you watch a fighter, and that's the crazy thing about fighting, there's like 10,000 different belts. There's freaking like so many different weight classes, so many ways to promote somebody to fight somebody else. Hell, we're seeing people that don't even fight fight each other nowadays. <laughs> YouTubers, TikTokers. <laughs> I'm saying so. What I'm getting at is that it's just the person that you're invested into that's causing all of this fanfare and attraction, and that's what we're missing in our sport. You know what I mean? Until Shakari got caught smoking weed, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Boys wasn't interested, you know. And then now, all of a sudden, people want to get into track and field. You know, it, she was running fast. What about that? You know what I mean? Like, so that's kind of where I'm at. I think running fast should no longer be the prerequisite of getting paid and track and field. I want to change that narrative and I'm going to change that narrative over time. So in the next five years, we should be able to brand things, brand athletes better, brand the sport better. And then obviously, you know, we're going to be coaching pros. So we're going to get a few of these pro athletes paid. I'm talking stupid paid. Mm -hmm. And they don't have to be fast. I mean, they're going to be fast, but you know what I'm saying? They're going to be good people that have great character that people like to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I think you, you hit the nail right on the head there. First, wait, so could we see a, so a Coach Will boxing match? Is that coming out then? We, we, we... I mean, y'all don't want these hands. I'm telling you, it's a little different. <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Galene, Texas. So I'm telling you, it's a little different. <laughs> Not seeing it. So, but you hit the nail right on the head that I think uh -huh. for all of the, the benefits to the good, the good stuff and the faults that, you know, UFC and boxing has, they can tell a story mm -hmm. really well where yes, you got people that haven't won a fight in years get paid millions and millions because there's a story behind that athlete. They, the hardships they went through, the trash talking before the race, all of, or the, the fight, all that stuff. And we don't have that much storytelling in track. We didn't see it until the only two storylines this year I saw, Shakari Richardson and DK Metcalf, because oh, a football player running track and Shakari Richardson, you know, who has a personality, God forbid. And yeah, finally saw and she's honest. She's and she's honest. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. The track and field is, but nobody's capitalizing on it. You know what I mean? That's the point. Shikari did all that and made no money. She was on the Kanye beat situation and it made no money. You know what I mean? Like not say no money, but not the type of impact, you know, that you would want to see. I would want to see this thing keep continue. She should have been on more shows and more interviews. She should have been talking about why she smoked weed and what happened and, and just really let it open. Same thing with Lolo. Lolo ain't did no running and no winning of nothing too much. That girl's a millionaire, man. And she's known. She ain't no world champion. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So that's what I'm getting at. You don't have to be good in track to be to be known, you know, to be successful in track. You know what I mean? Like I'll give you an example. Like Tara Davis is an elite athlete. And um, her, her her husband now, you know, what I mean, he's an elite athlete for Paralympics as well. But it's not about their eliteness. It's about their relationship. It's about what they represent. It's the brand. It's a whole lot more. They're good people. They're good kids. They look good. You yeah. know, what I mean, it's all all that plays into this. And I want people to pay more attention to that. You know, these kids have opportunity to, to use their image in college now. And that's it. That's just what it is. You need to use your image properly. And really understand what a brand is and create a brand. I believe in that. Exactly. Yeah, I think we'll start seeing a lot more of that, you know, with these NIL deals and everything, you know, being able to, hey, let me utilize my brand. I, I need to know my worth so I can make a, a livelihood of this, whether I'm a world record holder or I'm a, you know, I'm just I'm just barely scraping by on the pro circuit. Um, you know, typically you can still be successful. You know, it doesn't mm -hmm. you don't have to be the fastest in the world to be, be successful. Um, Absolutely. And so now I want to talk about and close off with some current affairs of track and field. So we got okay. coming up very recently uh, announced Milrose Games. So out in New York, mm -hmm. the 60 meters, we're going to be seeing Coleman making his return, going up against Trayvon Brumell, uh, Noah okay. Lyles, Ronnie Baker. Uh, that's, it's been all over track and field social media. And so who not to ask, but the, one of the, the quintessential sprint guys here, what are, what are your, what's your take on this race? What's going to go down? Any predictions or just stuff to look out for with this 60 that we got coming up uh, pretty soon? I'm going to be real with you, man. And if you want me to be honest, I'm not a hype man. I'm not a fake man. I love to keep it real. Uh, 60s don't really add up to hundreds. You know what I mean? So whatever does happen doesn't really make it a conclusive prediction for the future in the hundred. But I like to see people like the race. I like to see the races and stuff. And I like to see Coleman come back. I know you're going to drop something nasty because that's what he does. He runs the 60. So obviously I think Coleman's going to win, you know, but um, I'm really good friends with Ronnie. So, you know, Ronnie has a great start. I think Ronnie's going to be one of the top guys in there. I think the 60s use indoor as an opportunity to get their acceleration and start together while in a competitive setting. So I think it's just dope to watch. I'm glad that people are excited to see it. And this is one of the hottest fields ever to be assembled. So I mean, this is going to be a good thing to watch. I'm definitely going to check it out and see it. What I'm more interested to see is what is what is the feel from Coleman? Like, does he feel kind of pissed? Does he feel like he got to do something to you? You know what I'm saying? Like, does he feel some kind of way? And that's what I'm getting at. That's the energy I'm trying to hear about. I'm not really – yeah, I know he's going to run like 6'4 or something. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I get that. Or 6'3 something. You know what I mean? I get that. I'm not going to be impressed with any of that. I want to know why he out here. That's more what I'm interested in. So that's, that's me being a devil's advocate. I'm trying to see more from Coleman and hear more from him. Like, I know Ronnie. Ronnie's chilling. Ronnie's just training and getting ready. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think Coleman has like a, you know what I'm saying? I think he has something inside of him from not running so much, you know, before and being having to sit out. I want to hear about that feeling because people feel that sometimes, you know, and I want, I want people to understand what it feels like to come back, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, he's been out for nearly two years. I mean, his last race was February 17th and of 2019 or 2020, 2020. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so it's been a long time since he's, he's been able to compete and seeing all these other top level sprinters, you know, taking medals that I'm sure he feels like, man, that should be mine. Like I should have, mm -hmm. I should have won this. Like, I, I feel like that's only been brewing up. So now when you finally make your return in, in New York, the, you know, the, a whole bunch, a big field and it's going to be a probably a pretty, pretty good crowd. I can only imagine like, you know, what, what are those emotions going through in your head? And mm -hmm. see, that's a, a great opportunity where I hope there's some cameras taking videos and doing some stuff and, you know, get the, uh, yeah. see what the, we may need to do on. a live. We, we may need to do a live with him real quick and see how he's feeling. And then I might have to reach out to him and see, cause I, I'm, I'm interested to see what he's going to say. For sure. It should be, it should be an exciting one. Um, mm -hmm. and then wanted, wanted to close it out with, uh, two last ones for you. Uh, so first, who would you say has, if you can't narrow it down to just one person, you could say a few, uh, but the best starter in sprints right now. Oh, a starter in sprints right now, like the best start person. Yeah. Hmm. Out, best out the blocks. Out the blocks. I mean, obviously it's Coleman. I mean, it is, it's, it's Coleman. It's never not going to be Coleman. The, the shin angle that he comes out is can't nobody, uh, not that can't nobody, but not many individuals have the physical capabilities and the physical physical attributes that allows them to hit those shin angles, those consistently. 
He's so light. He weighs like 145, but he can squat like almost 550 or 600. You know what I mean? Some stupid number. So he's like three times his body weight he can squat. So he can come in so deep and then he can continue to push where if a bigger dude, you know what I mean? It's not I'd like a type of power. He, even though he's so powerful, he's still tall. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So <laughs> the angles are not the same and the ability to push through those angles are not the same. So he's he's the best starter I've seen ever, I think. Yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. just the power that he has and to be able to get out that that toe dragger and all that stuff, just crazy, crazy He's the power. best. He, yeah, yeah he's, the, he's the best starter I've seen in my lifetime. I mean, I ain't going to lie to you. I don't think too many people can do it as fast as he can the first 30. You know what I mean? And then last one for you, if you could combine a sprinter, get the best attributes of all to make one, you know, like uh, one ultimate sprinter, what which aspects would you want to take from? I would from- take I would take Coleman and I'll take Coleman and Noel Lyles and it'd be perfectly mixed. You know what I'm saying? I'll, I'll take all of Coleman's start and acceleration and add it to Noel Lyles' transition to top end. I mean, if Noel Lyles can create as much velocity as Coleman can, Noel Lyles would be the fastest human ever to run. Do you see what I'm saying? He's just he's just not able to create the velocity that. Coleman's able to do and Coleman is just not good on top end because the way he uses his feet his feet go sideways and then his timing with his arms he's doing this so you know he's cleaning it up over time obviously but I mean if you look at uh Noah man Noah's last two steps be like the best steps ever you know what I'm saying so it's like it's like like textbook you if you could put those two guys together you're gonna get like 18 9 in the, in the 200 and you're gonna get like 9.51 or something you know what I mean because Man, that top end is insane for Noah Lyles, and that start and acceleration is insane for Coleman. Those are the two fastest people I've seen in my life. You know what I mean? Yeah, the some some crazy speed, and to be able to see that Lyles can do it across the all the way up to the two hundred. Like he's been he's been the world lead what three or four years now in a row. Like he can run the four. He just doesn't want to run it though. Dude can run yeah. the four. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure there's a bunch of those two hundred meter guys uh, that could do a four, but are like, yeah, I don't. I don't know if I want to extend my workouts a little longer. Let me let me stay let me stay where I'm at. <laughs> That's true. I mean, back in the days, a lot of the guys and some of the Jamaicans and some of the older school guys are starting to are keep doing it. They run a four by four early in the season. Uh, they do 400 meter training, so I mean, they can run a four literally, like um, literally run a four. But you know, if they choose not to nowadays, and I guess in public, they do it in practice. I guess. Yeah, I guess that'll have to work um Mm -hmm. well thank you so much coach will for joining us today it's been awesome connecting learning more insight on sprinting and track and field uh where could people go if they wanted to to learn more about uh fast you and and what you guys are producing yeah fast university everywhere so just at fast university youtube tiktok instagram uh my twitter handle is faster period so f-a-s-t-e-r and then spell out period um and that's pretty much it we're uh i'm on linkedin as well so for all my older business connections holla at me you know i'm on linkedin as well um will collins and that's pretty much it we put a lot more stuff on youtube uh here soon so you should be looking out for that as well awesome awesome well thank you so much coach will for joining us thanks for having me man thank you no problem no problem And, and thank you to everyone who's been listening this has been another episode of track world news If you want more content, go and follow us on Instagram at Track World News. We post different clips, highlights, and all that type of stuff. But um, awesome. Have a good one. Talk to you soon. Peace.